Welcome everybody, good morning. It's good to have you all here. I, I am very proud to stand here with the commission, other people uh, to do with our pension system, but I want to especially thank the chair and vice chair of the pension commission, uh, Chair uh, Mike, uh, Representative Tobash, I'm sorry, and, and uh, Treasurer Joe Torsella uh, for chairing this. Uh, the commission met this morning and, and uh, the report uh, that you see before you uh, is the unanimous recommendation of this, this commission. Uh, and I will say a few things, but before I do, I'd like to turn this over to the chair, Mike Tobash, Representative Tobash. Governor, thank you, and we appreciate being here today uh, and the attention that's being paid to this really important issue for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I can tell you uh, that many of us around the Capitol uh, talk about fiscal stewardship very often, uh, but what often occurs to me is that when we're faced with a choice uh, to give our citizenry more of what they want, that might be wider roads or uh, newer schools or a bigger benefit check, many of us lean towards the giveaway before focusing on the taxpayer and the efficiencies in the systems and the processes. The work of the commission offers a unique opportunity to do both of those things. You see, by improving performance on some of the Commonwealth's largest assets, roughly $90 billion under management, by the way, that's not nearly enough uh, to take care of the obligations that we've got, we can accelerate our opportunity to shrink more quickly the biggest single anomaly, anomaly in our budget, thereby helping bring back a line item in the budget that should never have allowed to been reached uh, this outrageous level. In the United States, employers on average pay about 3% of the payroll towards the retirement benefits of their employees. Pennsylvania right now finds itself setting aside more than 30% of our payroll to catch up on mistakes of the past. Nearly 10% of our budget is going into this one line item and it makes it very difficult to fund the other important requirements that exist in Pennsylvania today. Here's the good news. We have become more focused on this problem and more forward thinking. From resetting our benefit structure to a plan for future employees that recognizes Pennsylvania as a leader in providing generous, flexible, and sustainable retirement benefits to a Commonwealth whose General Assembly is realizing that it is ultimately responsible for managing, expecting world-class performance from its partners. It's the legislature and the administration that established these pension funds nearly a century ago. The benefit structure is one determined by our laws and the payments into the plans are a function of our budget process. Doesn't it only make sense that we take seriously the oversight on performance, cost, and transparency? The establishment of the commission through Act 5 of 2017 and the work the commission has done does just that. Over 25 expert witnesses testified from four countries 14 states, and five public pension funds. The commission reviewed over 5,000 pages of studies, articles, and reports. The work is comprehensive and realistic. It rec its recommendations find, and if they are embraced and implemented, this will re report will become a model of success for many other pension plans that seek to maximize performance. This is a very important note. This document does not stand as an indictment of what has gotten us here, but rather as an opportunity for outstanding future results. Pennsylvania stands to be recognized as a front runner in reform if we can effectively implement the report and its recommendations. Changes to our perspective and culture will allow us to perform more competitively among our peers. With that said, I would like to thank my fellow commissioners who have dedicated themselves to this daunting task. Commissioner Torbert, Bloom, Gallagher, and Torsella have brought varied perspective and expertise to the commission. Their work stands as a testament to cooperation, 
bipartisan, bicameral, focused on results and on our charge. I am proud to have worked with these gentlemen, dedicated staff, and the Pennsylvania House Research Department, as well as the work that the Treasurer's Office has put into the report. Their staff was committed, and the incredible resources that they brought to the table have been very important. They worked and led on compiling the report, and without their involvement and commitment, Pennsylvania would not be in a position to benefit to the extent that they are in a position to benefit today. Mr. Treasurer, I value your competency, your work on assembling some of the greatest authorities on investment practices, and now at the end of the process, I value our friendship. Mr. Treasurer, Mr. Vice Chair, would you like to address the room? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to my friend and colleague and, and Chair, uh, Representative Tobash, for your uh, patient and thoughtful and determined um, and inclusive leadership of this process, um, which has so much to do with why it's been brought to such a successful and uh, remarkably uh, unanimous and bipartisan conclusion. Um, I also want to express my gratitude to uh, my fellow commissioners, um, Commissioner Torbert, Commissioner Bloom, Commissioner Gallagher, for what has been, uh, I think we all agree, a, uh, an exhaustive but rewarding process uh, on, on behalf of the, of the citizens we serve. Uh, and to you, Governor, uh, for your leadership on this issue. Um, and with the General Assembly for your foresight in, in launching this through Act 5. Um, I think we all know that our pension funds face some huge challenges here in Pennsylvania. Uh, they together uh, owe approximately $64 billion more to Pennsylvanians uh, than they currently have. I think we also all know that there's been real and bipartisan progress in tackling this issue, as witnessed uh, by the by uh, Act 5 uh, in, the, in recent memory. Um, what I like to remember when we talk about pensions is that as abstract and large as those numbers are, that behind them are real people um, with real stories. And it's easy to get lost in the kind of bigness of this issue and the numbers that go with it. Um, but behind that are, is the hard work of taxpayers who constitute the employer and the hard work of people who have dedicated their lives to public service who are the beneficiaries of these funds. Um, and as much as I might occasionally lose sight of that, my mother, who's one of them, tries never to let me forget it. And, and in that spirit, I think we as a commission approach this work, viewing that the suggestions that we could offer are and could be fundamental to securing the promise that we as a community have made to people who've given their lives to public service. Uh, the, process by which we did that on behalf of those nearly 800,000 Pennsylvanians was extensive and time consuming um, and perhaps the most fundamental comprehensive examination of, of uh, these issues in, in the state's history. What you see before you represents literally the documents that were reviewed by this commission, uh, except for the two small ones in front, small relatively, which are the copies of the report. Um, and as the chairman said, this, and important for me to reiterate, this is not about, was not about rehashing uh, past issues or casting a finger of blame. It is about looking back in analysis in order to learn and to get insight for charting a course for the future. Uh, and I am proud to say I, th I think we've done that. Um, I think we have outlined a course uh, that can take us all to a better place. Um, we need to do better on cost, um, acknowledging that that has been a focus uh, of the funds, acknowledging uh, the progress at SERS, for example, where fees have been cut almost in half over 10 years. Um, it's simply the case that at a time when we only have 60 cents on the dollar for every uh, dollar we need to pay out, we should lead the way to cost savings um, and prudent investing, and that every every dollar that we can keep from going to Wall Street and keep working here in Pennsylvania puts these funds in a much better place. And a central theme of this report is that costs matter and they matter a lot. We heard repeatedly that we can't control the investment returns of asset classes, but we can control our, our risks and our costs and that if we watch both carefully, 
Um, come what may, uh, we will do well in the end, even though along the way there will be lean years and fat years. Um, the report outlines a potential nearly $10 billion on an actuarial basis savings from a variety of recommendations, um, some of which have more than one possibility associated with them. That is a significant amount of money that makes a material difference, will, will make a material difference um, in, in the status of these funds and, again, the, the real-life people behind the abstractions over the course of those 30 years. Uh, we need to take a hard look at risk, and the report outlines some ways in which uh, we believe the fund should do that. Um, we need to and can do much better on transparency. Um, a lot of funds around the country are grappling with, with this. I want to acknowledge here, um, briefly as the report does, the real progress that's been made on this issue, um, particularly at PECERS, um, which uh, recently examined uh, at, uh, to, for its board and the public. Uh, the use of carried interest and has led over the years uh, in some ways, including posting investment memoranda that the board looks at online. Um, but we believe we can do better. We believe Pennsylvania can be a real leader in transparency and not as a kind of a curiosity, but because transparency is the key to accurately evaluating what we're getting for what we're paying and making this conversation that this report has entered into a more productive one for everyone, but most especially uh, for beneficiaries. Um, we need to do better on innovation, where we have some good stories to tell, but where the report proposes uh, that we create a consolidated investment office for both of our funds to leverage the scale of that combined nearly $90 billion, as the chairman said, to drive a harder bargain on behalf of Pennsylvanians, to develop internal capacity, um, and to do things in, a, in an innov innovative and effective and modernized way as some other of our peer states have done. Um, and finally, all of us here, I think, should acknowledge, again, without casting blame on the past, that we need to do a better job going forward on living up to the commitment that we as a state have made to these beneficiaries and these funds. Um, as the report details, as numerous witnesses detailed, um, there was a long period in which the state failed to live up to that obligation. It is commendable um, that, that this governor and this legislature have for the past three years, and I haven't, I haven't seen the budget address he's giving in a few weeks, but uh, hopefully for four, um, have, have fully funded the actuarially required contribution of the funds. That is a hopeful new chapter in our history here, but it is vital, uh, at, it is vital that that chapter continue in the years ahead. Uh, so with all of that, um, I, I want to just close by saying uh, this new path, I think, is one um, that will present some challenges. Uh, change is uncomfortable, but it is one full of opportunity and promise for all of us, for our two funds, and for um, all of their stakeholders. Uh, it will take us, if we, if we have the courage to set out on it, to a healthier uh, and better place where we can be, continue to be proud of that we in Pennsylvania keep the promises that we make um, and work hard to keep every possible uh, dollar of value that Pennsylvanians and public service have contributed working on their behalf. Um, so it's my hope really that today for the five of us uh, represents somewhat of an end of a, of a, of a, of a six months plus process, but in a more fundamental way represents the beginning, a beginning of a a conversation and a renewed commitment to action in the months ahead as the, as the systems and the legislature uh, and the administration review and I hope act on these recommendations. Um, it's also my hope that the spirit that's animated this commission of bipartisan and common sense um, and common ground finding will remain the spirit that animates this discussion going forward. Uh, and for my part and for the part of everyone at Treasury, I want to say that we look forward to working uh, with leaders in both parties, um, many of whom have become friends through this process, uh, to continuing to do that and to implementing and embracing these recommendations. Uh, so now I'd like to, it feels funny for me to welcome the man whose reception room this is, but I'd like to welcome um, Governor Wolf to, uh, for some fuller remarks and to thank him once again for his leadership on this issue.
<clears throat> thank you very much. And I, I just want to, again, thank the commission, thank uh, chair, vice chair, for doing such a phenomenal job. Um, all the documents you see in front of you, the, the thick books are, are the evidence, the testimony, all the things they, they sifted through to come up with the reports that are sitting in front of them. So uh, they have done phenomenal work, and I, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the hard work all of you have done. So thank you for that. And I'm proud to be here with all of you to, to talk about this. This is yet one more way that we are working together, both Democrats and Republicans, to reform our pension system and save the state precious dollars without putting retirement security for any Pennsylvanian at risk. Throughout my first term, I think we have all made significant progress at controlling our pension costs. The recommendations in this report represent another important step in that overall process. As you'll recall, last year we all came together, 2017. We worked together across party lines to enact historic pension reform. It was pension reform that actually was applauded by the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. I think that's really important. But Act 5 of 2017 made significant improvements in our system. Among them, first, it provided long-term stability for our employees. Second, it reduced costs, so many more money stays in the pockets of Pennsylvanians. Third, it shifted unnecessary risk away from taxpayers. Four, it's going to introduce a new 401k style plan option for new employees starting next month. Fifth, it will save over $10 billion on an unfunded pension liability. That's over a 30 year period, actuarial assumptions of what, seven and a quarter percent return. It will help school districts so state funding stays in the classroom with our children. Seventh, and it called for the creation of this commission to review Pennsylvania's pension system and to make recommendations. Those recommendations are going to do two things. They're going to help modernize how they do business, pension systems, and how they continue to reduce costs for all of us. The report released today is the result of many months of diligent research and analysis by the Commission. It provides a roadmap for the Commonwealth, especially SIRS and PSIRS, to do four things. To continue that transformation. To second, modernize investment practices and policies. Third, to improve transparency. And fourth, cut excessive costs and fees paid to Wall Street banks. When I ran for governor four years ago, I said one of the best ways we can rein in pension costs is to rein in the amount of money we spend to manage our funds. And we've made some progress with pension reform over the last year. And now with the tremendous work of this commission, as a result of that act, we have a path that's going to help us further reduce, reduce those fees. With these common sense reforms, we can save nearly $10 billion over the next 30 years. That's $10 billion in taxpayer money that will benefit Pennsylvanians rather than Wall Street bankers. This is a tremendous accomplishment. And when combined with the other recommendations made by the Commission and the reforms already in the pension law, we will further benefit all Pennsylvanians. So I, again, I want to thank Representative Tobash, Treasurer Torcello, for their efforts leading this commission and for all the commissioners for making these recommendations. I look forward to continuing to work to implement the commission's recommendations, and I hope to partner again with both Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate to change the laws where needed so that we can continue to make government work smart and protect the interests of all taxpayers. Now, Treasurer Torcella and Representative Tobash and I would be happy to take any questions. There's quite a few things on this list to say just enacting legislation. Have you had any conversations with legislative leaders on getting some of this stuff done for next session? Uh, obviously, we've had continuing conversations, uh, but the report just came out today. So I'll let, as a member of the legislature, maybe you want to comment. So, yeah, I'd, well, I'd like to point that uh, to, to my left are members of the General Assembly, my colleagues, and they have been paying close attention uh, to the work that the Pension Commission has doing. Uh, as a matter of fact, I believe that, uh, in fact, in the Senate, I believe a co-sponsor memo has already been circulated uh, discussing the fact that consolidation is an important element and a recommendation in the report. How many of the recommendations actually need legislative work, and how, much, how many can be done administratively? Can you sort of break that down? 
I don't, don't have a precise count. The, the majority of them could happen, uh, and, and the report states that uh, in cases where we're suggesting legislation, um, there, there are substantial parts of recommendations that could happen on their own. Um, for example, the, you know, the recommendation to move to uh, indexing public securities doesn't need any legislation. Um, there are, and I illustrated when I was talking about some of the PCER steps, um, there are transparency steps that both funds can, uh, in our view, should take uh, that, that don't require legislation. Um, but then there are also, there's in the report, there are particular items uh, around a kind of one unique circumstance that relates to one fund around transparency. Uh, the, this, the establishment of a central investment office is something that uh, uh, does require legislation. Um, that, uh, but as, as my colleague said, you know, there, there's been ongoing conversation about many of these issues. Representative Miller had a bill on transparency this year. I don't think any of these themes will startle people. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I'm hopeful that for the, for the few that require legislation that that will happen. Yeah, I think when you take a look at the onset report, you'll, you'll, see that, you'll, you'll see that, you know, continued collaboration between the administration, the systems, and the legislative body are really needed to implement everything. And our success really depends on that cooperation and collaboration, how well we do. Said y'all, the state is overpaying for investments. We've heard that before. The report lays out that both SERS and PSERS are near the bottom in terms of their performance uh, relative to other funds. It's a really sharp critique of what the investment results have been. I don't see details in the report that name names in terms of the investors that have underperformed, fees that have been extra high. Do we know, you know, uh, which funds you, you've overpaid for? Just real quick, and what is going to change structurally? Will the boards look very different when you guys are done with this legislation? Let, let me just take a, uh, again, I've been in politics for a little less than four years now. When I was in business, um, we, we always uh, looked at process rather than, than people, and I think this report is really focused on the, the changes in the, in the process. This is not an attempt to create a blame game. Uh, I think there's enough uh, we could we can look at, at the difference. But they say there's nothing wrong. You're not making the case here is exactly what is wrong. You're just saying the results are bad, we're going to make them better. Well, with the processes we changed, I think there were a number of recommendations that I outlined, the report outlined, so I think that's unfair of you to say that we're not making recommend. They're not making recommendations. They are. And the recommendations are really focused on how we change the, the process. So I, I think uh, if we do this, we get the legislative changes that, that the report suggests. Uh, and, and we uh, change the way we're doing things. Right now, those process changes should result in $10 billion of savings. How the board's going to change and, and the central investment office? Is it going to look more like the SERS office or more like the PSERS office or something completely different? The, the central board is going to, well, the recommendations speak for themselves. I think it's, it has a separate uh, entity, uh, and that's, that's what we have to, to create. But it doesn't exist right now. Again, that's a change in process. I don't know if you want to weigh in on this. Sure. I, I would just point out that in the, in the savings that are identified, that the creation of a consolidated office um, is, is, is a relatively, uh, I, don't, I don't want to dismiss $2 billion actuarially as small, but that's a relatively small percent of that. Um, wait, wait, wait. Isn't the, the impact of that office going to be a lot greater because it's going to buy cheaper investments that perform better? And that, that's partly what's costed out. But there remain... Uh, you know, billions in savings that, 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 that do not require that. As the governor said, it's the hope. Uh, the report does not propose uh, you know, changing current boards. It proposes creating a new consolidated investment office that would um, combine capacities and scale um, and allow us to bring more expertise to bear. Uh, so as, as the governor said, this, is re this really, I think we worked hard to make this not about uh, uh, not about naming names, but about learning from the past and charting a course forward. Um, on, on the central investment office, are you talking about just an office to invest the funds or manage the funds, manage the overall operations of it? So instead of having two separate systems, you now have one system or, or everything? What do you find it? 
So, so just the idea that we've got uh, these two massive systems in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, not every state has that, it begs the question that shouldn't we do a little bit more collaboration? And the easy answer was why don't we take the investment functions and try and get some synergies between the two, get better break points. Look, both systems um, have, have roughly the same time horizon and investment strategies. So let's, let's get on the same page here in the Commonwealth and let's see if we can uh, perform better and reduce costs by, by building some some collaboration between the two. Again, uh, the idea, and the governor mentioned it, and the, and the report particularly does not uh, go after specific mandates, although there's some mandates that exist that should be looked at. And I think that uh, with the fact that we're adding transparency to the process, shining some light on some things that many investment professionals and experts in academia have pointed out to the commission and in turn to the General Assembly, to the administration, and to the systems where they can perform better, I think that we'll see uh, positive results. So, so if you're going to recommend one investment office, why two separate management offices? Why, why not merge them all? So, so I, think, I think that this report is very realistic in what we can accomplish in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That doesn't mean that that work does not continue to need to be done. Um, you know, the idea uh, that we can take a look at the investment functions of both those offices and, uh, and establish something that uh, unifies them, I think is, is really important right now, and I think it's relatively simple for us to do. Uh, so the idea that we might consolidate these two massive systems, particularly in the short term, I think is not a realistic objective. If you take a look at this document, you'll see that what we're talking about here is common sense, practical approaches on how we can save money within the systems and perform hopefully even better than we've performed in the past. And we looked and heard from folks around the country, and the model we're proposing is one that's out there that works, where you know, there are different, they're, they're different systems with different constituencies, uh, but where there's sort of a central investing office to do what we're hoping to do here, which is leverage scale and get a better deal for beneficiaries and taxpayers. Um, that, was our, that was our mandate in this, and, and that's what we looked at. Well, let's just keep in mind, we're talking about two processes here. One's the investment process, and one is the process by which those investments are made. So do the investments have the returns? Uh, that, that takes management, and that's what the different pension funds should be looking at. This central office is to look at make, making sure that, that the process by which managers are chosen, by which they're uh, analyzed, and, and by which they're judged, they're evaluated, uh, those things, but that that is done in a, in a, a, a way that, that is different than it's done right now. Yes. Have uh, any other, well, are, are st any states similar to Pennsylvania in size of like, population or just public employees using this centralized investment office? We had, the, the report, as you'll see, has a, there are 10 states in the peer group. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, so look, when we're taking a look, and, and the treasurer mentioned it, when we take a look at how we performed in the past, just, you know, an idea on how we might perform better. So there are comparisons made, not only within this document, not only from our consultants, but comparisons are made through outside organizations all the time. Uh, and, you know, the idea that you're going to perform competitively among your peers, I think, is the responsibility of the General Assembly. When I mention the fact that we are the organization, the General Assembly, along with the administration, has established these plans about 100 years ago. We just changed the benefit levels. The benefit levels are set by statute. And the idea that we make payments into these funds, and if you take a look at the recommendations, one of the first recommendations is that we pay the bill when it's due. And we hadn't done that in the past. So for us to make sure so that we're getting that paid on time, that we're, that we're meeting the actuarial required contribution rate is really important moving forward. So a host of recommendations, comparison and transparency uh, that is level among other pension operations, I think, is really important for us to accurately measure ourselves. Um, um, when you guys talked about this in September, I believe uh, a big portion of the money that was being underreported, I think that was like $3.8 billion total in carried interest was one of the big parts of that. Um, I don't think SERS tracked that at the time. Are they going to start doing that? That's one of the I won't speak for them, uh, I, but except to say that I believe uh, I believe they've been working to be responsive to uh, I believe they've been working to be responsive to the issues raised at that hearing. Uh, but since you're standing next to the uh, executive director, um, <laughs> that's probably a question for her. 
and I can tell you this, that since the com commission was established in statute, I believe that the systems um, have, have gained more of a focus on just what the, um, what the mandate was of the commission in Act 5. So uh, I'm going to give them credit right now uh, for already moving down the path of adopting some of the things that are recommended in here. And hindsight in investment is 2020. You know, did you perform very well? How was the return? Um, there's going to be continued debate on this, uh, but I think the fact that we've got a document now as a guidepost to make sure that we're all rowing in the same direction, I think, is really important. Uh, I was just total, if you total up the first year projections for savings, um, it looks like it's about 100 to 120 million, depending on which options you take. Is that a number that you realistically think the state could? Uh, see as savings in the 1920 fiscal year, or are you talking about further down? Well, some, some of these could happen very quickly. Um, do I expect that they will all be uh, implemented within, within one year, um, particularly given you know, some, some legislative impact? Uh, yeah, that's hope, hope springs eternal, uh, but I think the idea there is that that's, you know, when they're annualized, what, what we'd see. Um, and then that was extrapolated as the act charged us with the actuarial savings. And by the way, we haven't sufficiently made this point, I think. The Act 5 charge was to identify $3 billion in actuarial savings, $1.5 billion for each system, and kind of broader language about the lowest level of savings. We're, we're, we've exceeded that by some factor. Yeah, for sure. And just, and just you know, be certain that we're massively underfunded in these systems. I mean, the Treasurer pointed out before, about 60 percent funded. So the idea that we might uh, improve performance and reduce cost is going to go back in and help us shore up these systems sooner than we would uh, if we were getting lower performance and spending more money on fees associated with the investments. So the idea that all of a sudden we're going to have $100 million laying around, the first thing we have to do is make sure that these systems are in a position to pay for the obligations that we have made to the retirees and future retirees of the, of the state of Pennsylvania. And I just want to keep reminding us that this is a three-pronged issue. One is the design of the plan, and I think we did a good job, bipartisan job, of, of changing the design. Uh, second part is the management, management fees. But the big chunk is, is that unfunded pension liability, and that, in many ways, is a, is a residue of the, of the past, of, of, of bipartisan uh, uh, administrations and general assemblies deciding not to pay the full bill. We are paying the full bill now. That was one of the recommendations of the commission, and I will, Treasurer Torcella, uh, will commit to at least proposing that we continue to do that. Um, as we move forward, and I think that will make that a lot easier, but there's still that the unfunded pension liability part. And by the way, nothing that anything that anybody does is guaranteeing that there's going to be any return. The $10 billion of savings is an assumption that that happens over a 30-year period, that there's a 7.25 percent that the discount rate that's assumed. That may change. The economy may be very different. 25, 30 years from now than it is right now. We just don't know. But if those assumptions hold, this will be a substantial savings to, to a huge unfunded pension liability. Yeah, Mark. How can you, you're recommending that the pension funds pull out of a wide range of investment contracts, management contracts. How can you predict that by doing that, indexing that money, that you're going to save? I mean, isn't there the possibility that an investment contract and a manager is going to beat the market over time? Yeah, the, the, uh, the idea is that, that if you have active investment, you do beat the market over time. There's precious little evidence that over a long term that actually happens. So mm -hmm. index funds have been... Is little over the long term that that actually that that happens? Yeah. Over what term? Ten years. Why ten years? Just long term, actually, I think you look five years. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it. It's well, about ten years. Is, is that... Just, we have data for ten years. But I mean, you can look at any time you, anytime you want. Uh, if you believe anywhere close to the efficient market theory, that uh, it is very hard to out pay outperform the, the, the market. So an index, uh, indexing your, your uh, investments certainly reduce costs if all else is equal. As you rightly point out, all else may or may not be equal. Who knows what's going to happen in this stock market? So you're, you're saying this is based on 10 years. We're going to save all this money based on our history of 10 years. Well, I'll let, I'll let these guys. Yeah. If, if, I could, if I can jump in a little bit and make a couple points. Number one, 
there, there's a long chapter in the report on this um, that I commend to you. Um, not as long as the 5,000 pages on the table, but um, number two, um, you, reasonable question, can it happen? But exhibit A is SIRS and PSIRS, both of which have, uh, in, in, you know, with slightly different flavors and ways, um, kind of embraced this for, for um, parts of their portfolio, and PSIRS actually was an early leader. Um, and now indexes all uh, U.S. equities. Um, and not to contradict the governor, but there, th what we heard with a, that was extraordinarily compelling is data that goes back 15 years over, over different market cycles that across every sort of every possible public asset class, um, there, are, there simply are no managers who over the long run can keep up with keep up with the index. That, that night, there's some debate about whether return is return from asset allocation is 90 percent or 95 percent or 98 percent. But there's consensus that the vast majority of the returns that any investor gets are based on asset allocation um, and not on not on the idea that within that you can really beat the market. And the the other evidence that emerged is that the that the record of any given manager in the rear view mirror has virtually no predictive value about the future. So that if when, when studies are done of managers who may have outperformed over a 10 year period, it tells you zero about whether they'll do it next year. So the basis of, the basis of our recommendation is, is the logic that's been embraced by um, and, and, and advocated for uh, institutions like ours from people from David Swenson to Warren Buffett, and that is our returns will come from the asset classes in the public markets. And while we can't control what those markets do, we can control the risk we take and we control how much we pay to get those returns. And that in the long run, um, that in, it, you know, over time, that that is the by far smarter choice that keeps more dollars in our pockets and more dollars working. Yeah, and I... And I, and I, and I Know that, well, so that, sorry, that these index funds be asset managers. So, I, I, look, I also wouldn't hang on a 10 year period. You know, you can say one, three, five, ten, or the life of the investment, right? So, whatever the case may be. But take a look at one of the, one of the other strong recommendations in the document is that we uh, adopt the standards of ILPA. That's the uh, investment limited partnership organization that exists right now so we can measure ourselves against other peers and other and other groups and see if we're really performing well. Uh, the idea that we're going to make investments and sometimes these contracts in great secrecy and I understand uh, the idea that you that you've got to uh, protect contracts and, and, and protect the integrity of those contracts uh, but we live in a world of transparency and the ability to compare ourselves against other investments uh, in similar classes in similar organizations and that we can compare them fairly uh, has us and gives us the ability to see that on a one, three, five, or ten-year basis that we're performing highly. The other, the other, the other point I'd make on this: Is there any sort of investment contract that you're leaving untouched, or are you kind of telling the pension funds get out of every contract and get everything into? Yeah, this is just about trade. They're not going anywhere. Uh, Private uh, investments, you're not you're well, not the, away from. Yeah, the report now. The report suggests that each fund needs to needs to re-examine those commitments, and we suggest reducing the illiquids because of some concerns we have about risk. Um, what we're, the indexing recommendations around public securities. Um, the other point I'd make on that is in, in the report there are within that also recommendations we found without naming particular managers that, for example, in some cases. Um, the cheapest manager was the best performing, the most expensive manager was the worst performing. There are recommendations in the absence of indexing um, to renegotiate contracts that have been found to be out of line. Uh, but it is, this, this is a comprehensive recommendation for public securities. Can you say a little more about that, reducing illiquids? Is that as a recommendation? Is there a target? Um, it's, I'd refer you to the, to the chapter in the report. It's not, we did not think it was our place to specify a, you know, a numerical target for two very different funds. Um, we uh, have an, an extensive uh, report from a consultant that's incorporated into the report that identifies some issues and we suggest in light of those issues to revisit at each board um, the allocation to illiquids, um, which you know, can cause real problems, especially in times of turmoil. I have a, uh, uh, an assignment from an editor 
you, you seem to take a different approach yesterday on the question of marijuana. Uh, legalizing marijuana. Why, why would you bring that up in a conversation about pension? Well, I, I need to get a question in before the stands run out of the hourglass here. But uh, okay. you, that, you, you seem to strike a different tone on that issue yesterday in your Twitter town hall. And uh, I'm just curious, what, what's caused your change of view yeah, on that? I, it, it's, it's, it is slightly different. I think uh, I'm looking at what's happening around us. The, the neighboring states, New York now, is the, the governor said that. He's bound and determined to move forward with this. I think New Jersey legislature is uh, dealing with the issue right now. Uh, and so I'm just trying to be a realist that, that, that this is something that, that we really ought to be uh, taking a look at in a, in a way that I, maybe I haven't before. Well, are you, in saying that yesterday in your tour of town hall, are you suggesting that you are going to make that a priority of your second term? No, I'm not. I'm just saying I'm going to look at what's going on uh, in the neighboring states and see if we can continue to learn from them and, and other states that have, through referendum and legislative action, legalized it and, and, and see what maybe we ought to be doing. I'm just keeping my eyes open. I'm trying to be a realist. How do you propose doing that? How do you propose taking that? This is the way I'm doing it right now, keeping my eyes open and reading and seeing what's going on. And, and what I said yesterday was basically a result of the change in the environment. Can't, we just can't duck our heads into the sand and say things aren't, aren't happening. New York, New Jersey, there are neighboring states. They're making a decision. I want to follow and see what, they're doing, what they do. Are you suggesting that it, it would be for the legislature to take the lead on that issue then? I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just suggesting that I'm going to be a realist and I'm, I'm recognizing that things have changed in the environment that I work in. Do you have a response to Senator Corman saying that that's reckless and sending the wrong message? Saying that I'm going to be keeping my eyes open and looking. He I don't. Out a I don't saying that it's a gateway drug and you're no, he wasn't message. saying what I was doing. I think what he was talking. I haven't read the complete release, but I think what he was talking about his concerns about marijuana. And I think there are people who have that. I'm trying just to recognize that the state of New York, the state of New Jersey, have made some decisions, uh, and that, that we just can't ignore that. Are you watching from a financial standpoint, from a criminal justice standpoint? Which part are you, are you most watching? I'm just watching. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.